Well, the music stopped, so that must mean someone's about to speak. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Phil Lambert, uh, and I'm the National President of the Australian College of Educators. On behalf of the college and our event partner, the Centre for Independent Studies, welcome to the Phonics in Context is Not Enough, Synthetic Phonics and Learning to Read debate. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Gadigal people uh, of this land on which we debate uh, and is being held. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to welcome the Honourable Rob Stokes, New South Wales Minister for Education, Mr Tom Swetzer, Executive Director of the Centre for Independent Studies, and this evening's moderator, Natasha Robinson, ABC's National Education Reporter. As you can see from the incredible number of attendees that we have, and the hundreds of people who have tuned in into the ACE website, we actually have over a thousand and a half uh, people, uh, a more than a thousand viewing uh, online, uh, and of course over 500 here this afternoon. Uh, it's no doubt going to be uh, and invoke a lot of discussion around the topic. The Australian College of Educators is the longest serving professional association for the teaching profession in Australia. In May 2019, we will be celebrating our 60th anniversary, a significant achievement by any measure. The college was formed with the specific intention of elevating the teaching profession in Australia and providing educators, all educators, with the opportunities and avenue through which to influence and direct their profession. The college today, more than ever, is about your career and our profession. And that is most definitely what this evening is all about, providing a forum in which educators and other stakeholders can respectfully discuss the myriad of ideas, experiences and practices relating to phonics and more broadly literacy and the ways in which the Australian education system needs to work collaboratively across all sectors, systems, subjects and levels to ensure the best possible outcomes for Australian students. We are fortunate this afternoon to have secured some of the leading educators, academics and professionals working in the phonics and reading arena in Australia. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the debaters who have given their time freely uh, for their effort and preparation to make this debate uh, already such an overwhelming success. I'd also like to make it clear that while there are many different opinions on phonics, how it's taught, its impacts and effectiveness, this evening has been specifically designed to invoke discussion, not argument, and the debate has been structured not as a win-lose outcome, but rather as a way to present differing views, opinions, and indeed evidence. The best possible outcome from this evening for the college will be for people to leave having broadened their understanding or possibly firmed their understanding and opinion regarding phonics and to ensure that educators through ACE are able to provide policymakers and their stakeholders with balanced and informed commentary into the development of education strategies at a state and national level. One final comment prior to introducing uh, Minister Stokes to formally open this evening I'd like to encourage all of you attending this evening and those watching in real time on the ACE website to consider joining the college, the Australian College of Educators. ACE is an important and significant professional association within the Australian education landscape. The college is the only non-partisan, non-industrial organisation delivering services, support and representing the entire education profession in Australia. The college is driven by its members and is focused on ensuring educators from all systems, sectors, subject areas and levels are able to shape their profession and influence uh, Australia's education in the most possible ways. For information on membership and the benefits of being part of the college, please make sure you visit our website. And now on to some formal duties. The Honourable Rob Stokes was elected to the New South Wales Parliament in March 2007 as the member for Pittwater. Throughout the course of his parliamentary career, he has held numerous positions, including Minister for the Environment, 
Minister for Heritage, Minister for Planning and most recently from January 2017, Minister for Education and he's doing a fabulous job. Rob has an impressive list of qualifications including holding a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Laws, Master of Laws, Doctor of Philosophy Law, Diploma of Biblical Studies, Graduate Diploma of Legal Practice and is the Solicitor of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Since his appointment as Minister for Education, Rob has raised questions regarding the continuation of NAPLAN, challenged the dominance of the STEM uh, orthodoxy in Australia and announced plans to declutter New South Wales uh, curriculum. Rob is committed to working with the teaching profession to drive significant reforms and progress. Also today we're having uh, uh, Natasha uh, Robinson and I'll introduce her later but right now I'd like to invite uh, Rob to speak. Thank you Rob. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. I too want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to Elders past and present and to acknowledge Aboriginal people who are in the room with us or who are uh, participating online. Uh, can I also acknowledge the wonderful uh, uh, co-sponsorship of both the Australian College of Educators and the Centre for Independent Studies uh, in hosting this debate? Uh, and looking out at the number of people who are here tonight, it is obviously an issue that evokes great interest and passion within the teaching profession. Indeed, when I was asked if I wanted to come along and provide some opening remarks, uh, my instant defensive thought was, uh, no, I'm, I'm doing my hair uh, tonight. Uh, and I, I wonder, I'm used, I wonder if sort of Archduke Ferdinand felt the same way when he was asked to speak at the Sarajevo Town Hall. Uh, but look, this, uh, this is an important debate and that's why it's thrilling to participate uh, because uh, it challenges different orthodoxies in the way in which we go about the, the, the miracle of teaching, reading and literacy more broadly. Uh, and I love the idea of challenging and testing orthodoxies. Uh, that is what education should be all about. Uh, we should be discussing dangerous ideas uh, and we should be engaging in robust debate. As Phil has said, uh, there is, uh, you know, th this is a robust debate, but it should be in no sense pugilistic uh, because uh, this is ultimately uh, about what is truly one of the miracles of our education system. Uh, that acquisition of literacy skills. And we know uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that literacy is the currency of communication. It's the rhetoric of relationship that builds civilizations. There is nothing really more foundational. And it's so exciting when I consider that so many of the debates in education are about peripheral matters that don't really matter a great deal, uh, that we get tonight to debate something that goes to the heart of what education is all about. Uh, so it is certainly a thrilling contest to witness and I certainly wish all the participants the very best of luck in articulating their various positions. I want to also add a point of some caution, however, in relation to this debate. This debate is ultimately about our young people uh, and how they best acquire literacy skills. It should not be in any sense devolve into some proxy about how we might test what great teaching looks like. Uh, I always instinctively get nervous about the idea of trying to develop quantitative tools to measure teaching practice because teaching, uh, like communication itself, is a relational uh, profession. Uh, we as well, <laughs> we might as well ask about how to measure uh, what a great father or a great mother looks like as we might ask to develop quantitative tools to ask what a great teacher looks like. The role of teaching is far more profound and it goes beyond any simple quantitative measure. That is not to say, however, this debate does not matter for the students and that is where our focus should be and I know that that is ultimately where the focus of the participants on the debate truly is. So to conclude, I thought 
um, perhaps to paraphrase the words of Bertrand Russell, who once said that the essence of the liberal outlook lies not in what views are held, but rather how they are held. Rather than being held dogmatically, they should be held tentatively, ready to be reviewed in light of better evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, all the best. Well, as you can guess, I'm not elsewhere doing my hair. <laughs> I'm here with Rob listening to, um, uh, looking forward to listening to the speakers and to introduce the speakers and to moderate the discussion. I have the great pleasure in welcoming to the stage Natasha Robinson. Natasha is the ABC's national education reporter. She has a background in writing on national affairs, particularly Indigenous affairs, law and immigration, and international crime. Natasha is a Sir Owen Dixon Chambers Law Reporting Award winner and Kennedy Awards finalist. We are very grateful for Natasha for contributing her time and expertise this evening. Can you join me in welcoming Natasha? Thank you very much, Phil, and thanks to a really lively and stimulating introduction from Minister Stokes tonight. Uh, some housekeeping matters first up. It's my job to moderate the proceedings this evening. We have several speakers and I'm sure that a lot of you have something to say, so I'll get the housekeeping matters over and done with first up. Um, I'd like to remind you all that this is a scholarly debate and the presentation of views will be based on evidence, expertise and experience. It's not a competitive debate. No team will officially be declared victorious. The persuasiveness of their arguments will be up to you personally to decide. And to ensure each speaker tonight is given the appropriate voice and the, for the sake of all audience members, we'd ask you first up to just uh, switch your phones to silent or turn them off. You might like to keep them on silent if you're on Twitter because we do have a hashtag you're welcome to contribute to tonight and you're welcome to tweet throughout the evening. The hashtag is hashtag phonics debate. Uh, the speakers, as Phil's mentioned tonight, are giving their time and providing their expertise free of charge. We'd like this to be a respectful discussion and we'd like all speakers to be acknowledged positively for their willingness to present tonight and for contributing to the success of tonight's debate. So for the format, I will introduce each of the speakers and then I will briefly introduce them again before they come to the lectern. Each speaker will have five to seven minutes to make their case. After all of the speakers have finished their presentations, there will be time for questions. I'll come back to this again once we get to that point, but um, in the Q&A session, we're asking that speakers pre please keep their, their uh, question to the point. Um, otherwise, it will be, of course, taken as a comment. Um, so now to welcome and introduce the speakers. Firstly, we have the affirmative team, and they'll be speaking in favour of our proposition tonight that phonics in context is not enough, synthetic phonics in the teaching of reading. First speaker for the affirmative is disting distinguished Professor Anne Castles. Professor Castles is the Deputy Director of the Reading Program at the Centre, sorry, for, at the uh, uh, Centre, sorry, it's a very long name, <laughs> Professor Castles, Centre, the Australian Research Council Centre for Excellence on Cognition and its Disorders at Macquarie University. The centre, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is a hub for collaboration among world leading institutions to conduct and, and disseminate scientific research on cognition, including reading development and teaching. Professor Castles is also President of Learning Difficulties Australia. She's published widely in prestigious academic journals and her most recent article is entitled Ending the Reading Wars, Reading Acquisition from Novice to Expert. It's been described by the renowned cognitive scientist, Professor Daniel Willingham, as a remarkable achievement. And I'm sure many of you will have read it. The second speaker for the, the affirmative is Dr. Jennifer Buckingham, who's a senior research fellow heading up the Education Policy Program at the Centre for Independent Studies. She's also the CIS's director of the Five from Five project. 
The Five from Five project aims to provide teachers, principals, teacher educators, parents, politicians and policy makers with information about the best evidence on how children learn to read and the most effective teaching strategies. The Five from Five project's objective is to reduce the number of children who leave school unable to read to a proficient standard. Dr Buckingham's doctoral research was on effective reading instruction for struggling readers. And last year, as I'm sure many of you know, she chaired an expert panel appointed by the federal government to provide advice on the introduction of a year one literacy and numeracy check and she's since been working with a number of state governments and non-government school authorities on developing literacy policies and trialling and implementing a year one phonics check. The third speaker for the affirmative is, Doc, is Mr Troy Veray. He's, a, he's an instructional leader at Marsden Road Public School here in Sydney. He has teaching and leadership experience in English and Australian schools for over 10 years. In 2016, Mr Veray was honoured with a Liverpool Principals Network Directors Award for his contributions as a teacher in an executive role at Marsden Public. He's a strong advocate for using evidence-based teaching and knowledge and a knowledge-specific curriculum to overcome social inequities. Uh, his professional interests focus on shifting the culture of education from one based on ideologies to one based on scientific evidence. And his current projects include, include developing teacher curriculum, content knowledge, cultivating evidence-based pedagogy and improving assessment practices for literacy and numeracy. He's also a current member of the Liverpool Local Aboriginal Education Consultative Group. And now for the negative team. The first speaker for the negative is <coughs> Professor Robin Ewing AM. She's a professor of teacher education and the arts at the Sydney University's School of Education and Social Work. And she's also a former primary school teacher. Uh, Professor Ewing's teaching research and writing include a focus on early language and literacy development, professional teacher learning, and the role that the arts can play in transforming student learning. She has a strong commitment to innovative teaching and learning at all levels of education. Professor Ewing's also chair of the academic board for the Australian Film, Television and Radio School Actors. She's a board member of West Words and an honorary associate at the Sydney Theatre Company. She's also a past president of the Australian Literacy Educators Association and the Primary English Teachers Association Australia. The second speaker for the affirmative is Dr Cathy Rushton. Dr Rushton has a strong interest in the development of language and literacy, especially in socio-economically disadvantaged communities and for students learning English as an additional language or dialect. She's an experienced EALD and classroom teacher, having worked in primary and secondary settings and with adults learning English. Dr Rushton is a lecturer in the Sydney School of Education and Social Work at the University of Sydney and she also provides professional learning for teachers, especially in the areas of literacy and language development. Her current research projects are on the impact that teacher professional learning has on students' literacy and language development and on the confirmation of student identity and the impact that that has on wellbeing, literacy and language. And finally, the third speaker in the negative is, is Mark Diamond. He's an educator of 30 plus years and the proud principal of Lansvale Public School Learning Community here in Sydney Southwest. Lansvale Public has a culture of excellence and it's been identified by the Centre for Education, Statistics and Evaluation New South Wales as a consistently high performing school. Mark was previously the principal of Green Valley and Ashcroft Public Schools. He was an active partner and co-researcher in the Western Sydney University Fair Go project and has been acknowledged by Western Sydney University as a lead learner for his contribution to the field of pre-service teaching and, and as a long-term participant on its external advisory board. Mark has also held the position of instructional leader, mentor through the Early Action for Success program in New South Wales. He's performed this role across five schools in southwestern Sydney. He was also a principal education officer in the Priority Action Schools program. 
So thank you to all of the speakers. <clears throat> I will now introduce the first speaker for the affirmative, Professor Anne Castles. Well, um, thank you first to CAS and ACE New South Wales for hosting this event and giving me the opportunity to speak for the affirmative in this important debate. I'd like to set the scene by making two points right at the outset. The first is that no one on either side of this debate is proposing that teaching phonics is all there is to teaching children to read. To claim that anyone is suggesting this would be to set up a straw man. On the contrary, our argument is that phonics is an essential foundation in learning to read and should be taught systematically, but not that it's sufficient on its own. The second point is that it's incorrect to assume that children learn to read in the same way that they learn to speak and understand. Children are born with the ability to acquire spoken language simply through interactions with their environment but we have no such predisposition for learning to read. Presented with a library of books, a child will not usually spontaneously begin to derive meaning from the sets of curves, lines and dots that make up the writing they see. Instead, reading is a learned skill that typically requires instruction. And our argument is simply that this instruction should include systematic phonics. So what do we mean by phonics? As most people here in the room would be aware, phonics is a teaching method. It involves explicitly teaching students the relationship between graphemes, or letters, and phonemes, or sounds, in an alphabetic writing system. Phonics programs are systematic when they teach these relationships in a structured and ordered manner, usually commencing with the simplest and most frequent mappings, and then progressing to the more difficult ones. Phonics taught in context, by definition, cannot be systematic, as there is little or no opportunity to control the nature or the extent or the sequence of the mappings that are being taught. So why, fundamentally, do we argue that the systematic teaching of phonics is important? Well, the answer here is quite simple in a way because it falls out of the nature of our English writing system. Our alphabetic writing system is a code for sound. The letters on the page represent spoken language. So if we teach children phonics, we teach them how to crack the code. They can go from those squiggles and lines they see to a spoken word. W-E-N-T, w-e-n-t, went. And if that word is in their oral vocabulary, they can then get from the sound of the word to its meaning, which of course is the most important thing. And if they have the code, they can do this independently without having the teacher tell them what the word is and without having to guess it. As well, the knowledge they have will generalize beyond individual words. The child with the phonic knowledge to read went will also be able to read ten and wet and net, for example. Now, of course, not all words in English, being a tricky orthography, follow standard mappings. But phonics will get, uh, basic phonics will get a child a very long way. In contrast, our English writing system is not primarily a code for meaning. There's no systematic link between the squiggles and the lines a child sees in words on the page and their meanings. So consider the words cat and cow. A child trying to figure out a systematic relationship between printed words and their meanings might first deduce that all words that begin with that C letter must be animals. But then they would see cup and can and cot and realize that they were wrong. There is no code that links print and meaning. So what this means is that teaching children to go directly from printed words to their meanings 
effectively requires them to engage in an arbitrary paired associate learning exercise. And there's no opportunity for generalization beyond any particular word. So our basic argument is that it makes t sense to explicitly teach children the code that our writing system actually represents, that between print and sound, rather than expecting them to figure it out for themselves or having them try and deduce some other code. Of course, you and I as skilled readers don't need to translate printed words into their sounds in order to understand them. We can go directly from print to meaning, as is evident when we fluently read and understand texts with seemingly no effort and without laboriously sounding words out as do young children. But we can do this precisely because we're expert readers. We've built up detailed memories over an extended period of the written forms of words that we're familiar with and we've linked those memories with knowledge about the words' pronunciations and their meanings. And indeed, research we've conducted shows that having children initially sound words out via phonics actually supports this process of building reading expertise. So to state this differently, going directly from print to meaning is the end point of learning to read. And although we want all children to get there, it doesn't make sense to start with the end point. An analogy would be to propose that we teach children to play piano by putting them in front of a Tchaikovsky score. On the contrary, we need to teach children the foundational skills that will allow them to make the most rapid progress possible towards becoming expert readers. And that includes teaching phonics. My points above are supported by all the major cognitive theories of reading. Without exception, these theories propose two mechanisms which skilled readers can go, by which skilled readers can go from print to meaning. One, indirectly, via the word sound, and one directly, to its meaning. These two mechanisms are also represented in two distinct neural pathways in the brain. And most importantly, research shows that when printed words are first encountered, even by adults, they're read and understood via that indirect pathway, via their sound. As familiarity increases, the words begin to be recognised and understood directly. So teaching phonics supports the development of the very cognitive and neural processes that we know underpin skilled reading. In summary, the evidence base is clear in showing that the journey towards children forming strong links between print and meaning starts with them forming strong links between print and sound. So let's ensure all children get the best possible start in this journey and open up the world of books to them by teaching them phonics explicitly and systematically. Thank you. Thank you very much. The second speaker for the affirmative is Dr. Jennifer Buckingham. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> first up, we have the uh, first speaker for the affirmative, Professor Robin Ewing. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this scholarly discussion. My colleagues and I have what we, as far as we can work out, at least 100 years cumulatively <coughs> of uh, working in education, working with children, helping them learn to read, working with teachers and working with pre-service teachers. I, I left my walking stick in the car. We certainly agree that learning to read, learning to be literate, is about children's life chances. And that teachers and parents are well positioned to help children very much on that journey. We also agree that uh, phonics is an important part of learning to read. But our position is that meaning comes first. 
that phonics is not enough to meet the in individual needs of each child. We also want to state very clearly that we have a very complex definition of what it means to read. And that is, is that it is about bringing meaning to text and constructing meaning from texts and texts in their very broadest sense. So we don't agree that, meaning, that reading is a set of discrete hierarchical skills, that they're linear, that they're technical, and that you need to start with the simplest. We actually feel that it's very important to bring all of the sources of information together for reading to happen. And, and once a child learns to read, it's almost like an epiphany when they bring all of those sources of knowledge together. They bring their understanding of the semantics, of the meaning that they've gained right from birth. They bring their understanding of the way grammar learn, works in their particular mother tongue. And they bring their understanding of the letter-sound relationships. So there's a whole range of strategies that need to happen alongside each other and they need to be meaningfully integrated. It's not sufficient just to privilege learning the sound letter relationship at the beginning of this journey. In fact, the journey begins way back when a child is born. And you start treating that baby as a meaning maker. You talk to that baby, you have a conversation right from birth as if they're going to talk right back to you. And guess what? They do. Because the research that happens has happened now that can record what happens within minutes after a child is born and that talking, that meaningful relationship begins, demonstrates that they begin to mirror back using their face, trying to um, copy what that adult is doing. So right from the beginning, things like oral language play and shared story and substantive conversations are really important. In fact, one of the most successful, one of the most strongest predictors of a child's success with reading is just that, that shared reading in the home, that number of books in the home, the opportunities to, to read and share story with an adult or caregiver or with an older peer. So we need to start with rich, meaningful language play. We need to help children understand the purpose and joy of reading right from the beginning and engage them um, right from the word go. And we need to start sharing stories that are rich and authentic. One of our huge concerns is if children are not allowed to engage with rich and imaginative text right from the beginning if the focus is on so-called decodable or contrived texts that don't make sense beyond the, the sem sentence level. And that is hugely concerning because children need to make the links with their own lives. They need to talk about the relationship between what they're hearing when they're being read to, and they need to engage with possibilities beyond their own particular context. Young children really want to get engage right from the beginning with the huge complexities of who they are and how they fit into this world. So let's not downplay the importance of giving them those opportunities by integrating what we do with meaning, 
phonics and syntactic knowledge right from the beginning. The other thing that really concerns us is that uh, associated with just thinking about synthetic phonics is this idea that children, all children who are six need to have a phonics check in which uh, 40 words, are, they're asked to read 40 words, 20 of which are pseudo words. That's hugely problematic if you accept the definition that reading is about making meaning. It's not just about recoding, coding from sound to letter. It's about making meaning. It's about decoding and going beyond that to make sense of what you're reading. So we're really worried that bringing another test, it's called a check, but it's really a test. Bringing another high stakes test for six year olds when the British research has shown that, um, that that's not a good thing to do for such young children it's not going to, to really be helpful. And anyway, where it has been used in England, it has not necessarily improved children's reading. It's not improved their comprehension. It's improved their opportunity to pass that test over the six years that it's been introduced. And it's going to disadvantage our EALD readers, children, it's going to disadvantage our children who can already read because they will be looking for um, those words to make sense. I'm being told that I must stop now, um, so I'm just going to go back to what I said right from at the beginning. Meaning must come first if we are truly talking about what reading is about. Teachers need to meet the needs of the individual child and we need to trust them as experts in helping children learn to read. Thank you very much, Robin. The spec second speaker for the affirmative is Dr Jennifer Buckingham. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to start by reiterating that the team speaking for the proposition is not arguing that phonics is the only essential skill for reading. The project I run is called Five from Five because it emphasises the five essential components of reading and all of the sub-skills that lie beneath those essential components. However, phonics is fundamental to reading development and it is the most contested and that's why it is the topic of tonight's debate. Accurate and fluent word reading is the route to comprehension or meaning making, and proficient decoding is the path to fluent reading. Teaching phonics in context, that is, in a way that is not sequential, systematic and explicit, is not enough to ensure all children gain this fundamental skill. Longitudinal studies have repeatedly found that a child's ability to decode is a strong predictor of their reading level. One recent study found that decoding and listening comprehension together accounted for 96% of variation in reading comprehension. The authors wrote, without adequate levels of decoding, oral language comprehension skills cannot be engaged to allow the comprehension of a written text. Teaching children to decode fluently using phonics is not teaching them to bark at print. In a journal article last year, Professor Kate Nation wrote, there's clear consensus and abundant evidence that in alphabetic languages, like ours, phonological decoding is at the core of learning to read words. This evidence come from, comes from research with sound, empirical or experimental methodologies that use valid measures of reading ability. Children who have learned how to lock, unlock the alphabetic code early can read independently more quickly, are more likely to enjoy reading, and therefore read a greater number and difficulty of text increasing their vocabulary and their comprehension and their engagement with literature. Written English is a more complex code than other alphabetic languages. 
many children will not work it out without effective instruction. Effective instruction is systematic and explicit. Teaching phonics in context is not. The basis for teaching phonics in context is the notion that students can only learn phonics well if teachers start with meaningful text rather than isolated letters or sounds. The phonics in context approach is based on the disproven theory that novice readers are making direct connections between print and meaning in the same way that skilled readers do. As Anne has explained, this isn't the case. Because of its flawed understanding of reading development, phonics in context promotes flawed models of teaching. Children are encouraged to use multi-cueing strategies to identify unknown words. They are told to use the context of the sentence and the grammatical position of the word as the first cues to what the word might be. Multi-cueing guidelines often encourage children to look at the pictures in a storybook to help read the words. Only as a final strategy is it suggested children look at all of the letters in the word. Unsurprisingly, studies have found this to be an inefficient way of reading. Good readers use phonological decoding, struggling readers use other cues to try to eventually arrive at the correct word. A British research team that's undertaken several meta-analyses of reading instruction recently wrote that putting semantic and syntactic cues on par with phonics for word reading is little better than guessing since they often lead to learners producing words other than the target. The meaning of a word is of course dependent on the context in which it is used. However, knowing what that word is in the first place requires adept phonological decoding. Some people offer heteronyms, words that are spelled the same but have different pronunciation and meaning, as proof that context is the primary cue for word reading and therefore phonics should only be taught in context. For example, one document asks, how does one know how to read the word spelled W-I-N-D without the context of the sentence? Is it wind or wind? Clearly context is important here to apply the correct pronunciation and meaning. But phonics allows the reader to narrow down the possible options to just two among thousands of four letter words. Without knowing phonics, it could be pretty much anything at all. International literature reviews have found systematic explicit phonics instruction to be more effective than non-systematic methods such as whole language, which spawned phonics in context. Expert reviews in, in Australia and in England considered evidence from a wide range of research and concluded that synthetic phonics was highly effective. An analysis conducted in England after synthetic phonics was mandated in 2005 found the adoption of synthetic phonics had led to significant improvements in reading particularly among children with the greatest risk of reading difficulty, that is children from disadvantaged backgrounds and those who are from non-English speaking backgrounds. Studies of high performing primary schools have found that high quality synthetic phonics was a common factor. There's a lot of fake news about synthetic phonics. So what is it? Synthetic phonics is so called because teachers build up phonic knowledge from the smallest units, letters and sounds which are taught in a direct and carefully planned sequence to help them come to grips with the alphabetic code. As Anne noted, this is not an understanding that children are born with. This new phonics knowledge is then embedded in the context of meaningful words and sentences. There's regular revision, practice and assessment. And this pedagogical approach methodically develops and fortifies the neurological connections necessary for fluent decoding. Sometimes making and reading nonsense or pseudo words is included in synthetic phonics programs for valid instructional and assessment reasons. Anyway, nonsense words, I think, are unfairly derided. Many wonderful books and poems are full of made-up words. Think Spike Milligan, Dr. Seuss, J.K. Rowling, and C.S. Lewis, just for a start. How tragic if we'd never got to hear Noni and John sing the Ning Nang Nong song on Play School. <laughs> Synthetic phonics does not restrict children to the phonic sequence. It's complemented by the words children see in their environment and in books, and adjusted for students with different levels of ability. Teaching synthetic phonics does not necessarily mean buying a program, and it doesn't mean that teachers' professional judgment is sidelined. Phonics instruction is sometimes referred to it as a back-to-basics approach. This is an unfortunate mischaracterization. The last 40 years has produced an enormously complex, yet remarkably consistent volume of research on reading from all over the world, and it's continually evolving. Synthetic phonics instruction 
reflects the cutting edge of our knowledge of how children learn to read and how to ensure that all do. Too many children have missed out on learning to read because of the rejection of that knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. The second speaker for the negative will be Dr. Kathy Rushton. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the waves. All mimsy were the borough groves, and the mome raths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Meaning comes first. Phonics is not enough to meet the individual needs of each child. I have five points I'd like to make in time, Helen, tonight. And they will be decoding, context, language development, poverty and the power of story. In his letter to the Minister of Education last December, um, Professor Max Coulthart mentioned that decoding comes first. We think that meaning comes first. And that poem that I read you by Lewis Carroll, of course there are nonsense words. They're in context, a context that can make sense. And we feel that that's what children should be able to do. Read texts from the very beginning, and the beginning is, as Robin said, at birth. They have meaning for them because meaning is what makes people want to tell stories, talk to each other or read. The context for that reason is the most important. Decoding is not converting letters on the page to spoken words. It happens in the head. It's silent reading. Anyone who's been at university doesn't read the textbook out loud to the tutor. We read for ourselves and we try to make meaning of the texts. We're always challenging ourselves with words we don't know in new concepts. But we can predict the meaning of some words from the context. We can use our prior knowledge of the subject matter, visual knowledge and knowledge about grammar to predict what the text is about. Phonological knowledge is essential but we'll see that the English language, it doesn't get you very far. Whereas children as young as two might be saying daddy wented or mummy goed, which means they've learned how to form the past tense in English. Now, they're doing it incorrectly because they haven't learned about irregular verbs, but teachers, we can handle that later on. But they bring that to a text they're reading. And if they're not lucky enough to have a parent or carer that can do this with them, I think that's what I want to be doing with four and a half year olds in kindergarten, is bringing them that sort of experience. Now, I'm going to quote a reading recovery teacher. Yes, there are still some of them out there. She said, Marie Clay says you can only read what you know, what you know about. If I bit, put a bit of quantum physics down in front of you, you'd revert to sounding out letters, not reading for meaning. You'd try to decode. And so it works with little kids, learning to read like it's so screaming obvious that if they aren't reading about stuff they've got the concept of, about their own experiences, they haven't got a mindset for what they're reading, so, of course, they're not going to read for comprehension. They're just going to decode words. That's a waste of time. <laughs> From the very start, language is developed in context through interaction. And that is how literacy develops as well. Our colleagues on the other side of the debate have noted the importance of vocabulary and comprehension but it's not something that can be left for later it needs to be what's happening first so the motivator for reading or speaking is making meaning from the very youngest children want to make a request 
make a command, make a comment or play with words. And they do this in a context where they're responded to, as Robin said earlier. So this is what we want to see happening in school as well. Professor Coulthard, in the same letter to ministers, talked about a wide range of factors which present serious challenges to literacy and academic success. But I don't think there's factors. I think there's a factor. It's implied by Gonski and confirmed in Tony Vincent's, the late Professor Tony Vincent's work in the Dropping Off the Edge reports. He noticed that there are a cluster of factors. The physical ones are most obvious, food insecurity, um, impairments like otitis media that can interfere with schooling, but less obviously in the work of Basil Bernstein are those children who come to school with an elaborated code that reflects the language of the school. The children who come to school with a restricted code that they're using at home are further alienated and restricted by a pedagogy that focuses on phonics at the expense of language development. Older students who struggle with reading and literacy usually have only one inadequate strategy for reading, sounding out, because they need more support with comprehension and oral language development. In the report through Growth to Achievement, published in March this year, it says laying the foundations for learning we should provide a seamless transition into school and engage parents, carers and students in their learning. So how to do this? Making meaning through the power of culture and story. One last quote. The children taught to read at the Mission House are much attached to books. Consider it a severe punish to be, punishment to be deprived of them and prefer the present of a new one to almost anything else. That's from Penny Van Torn, Writing Never Arrives Naked. It's a quote from William Watson in 1839. And he was talking about the Wiradjuri children from Western New South Wales. Nearly 200 years ago, what they wanted was to read. And I would hope that what we provide is an opportunity for teachers to develop a pedagogy that helps children want to learn to read. Meaning comes first. Phonics is not enough to meet the individual needs of any child. Thank you very much, Cathy. The third speaker for the affirmative is Troy Veray. Tonight we gather to affirm that phonics in context is not enough for our students to learn to read because phonics in context leaves reading to chance. Jennifer and Anne have summed up the extensive body of research about learning to read. It is the premise that children need explicit instruction in the five essential keys of reading, phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary and comprehension in every classroom every day. We must use instruction methods that are explicit, systematic and sequential. This is especially important. <laughs> this is especially important for teaching phonics, which unlocks the alphabetic code. It sets a strong foundation for future reading success. We cannot let children drift along using invented strategies to read. Put simply, don't leave reading to chance. <laughs> My teacher training about reading it left reading to chance. Until recently, the teaching of reading in my school left reading to chance. We didn't know the science behind reading, but with key changes to our teaching practice, we now make sure every child at our school, irrespective of their background, culture, or economic status, will be most likely to achieve reading success. We now stand by the statement, we don't leave reading to chance. I spent four years at university during my initial teacher education. Of the 32 subjects I studied, only three of them were about reading, three subjects. How could reading, the basis of learning and a predictor of future health, career and welfare be such a small part of teacher education? 
within those three subjects, I was taught one main thing. I was led to believe the optimal conditions for reading simply involve learning as being in an active social role in a similar fashion to the way in which children learn to speak. Put simply, I was taught very little about the science of reading and a vast amount about philosophical beliefs of reading. It was then by chance that I learned about the place of synthetic phonics in learning to read. In 2009, fresh out of university, I taught in London. At that time, the Blair Labor government was determined to raise the standards of reading in the first years of primary school. It introduced the teaching of systematic synthetic phonics, giving children the key building blocks they need to understand and read. This would lead to better fluency and comprehension success. It did not leave reading to chance. I began teaching systematic synthetic phonics and I haven't looked back. I've put in many hours to develop my understanding of the science behind reading. Surely the best practice for reading should have been developed during my initial teacher training. However, I now know if novice readers are explicitly and systematically taught phonics, they are most likely to achieve reading success. For my students, I no longer leave reading to chance. As a as of today, seven out of 10 15 year olds were unable to read at an age appropriate level. How can we continue to teach using whole language philosophical programs, which are meant to improve reading and believe that is best for our students? Of the 30% that are literate students, how many have accessed private agencies, have, such as tutoring centers to achieve their reading success? How can we leave reading to chance? But there is one school, of many, that have bucked the politically popular trends and ideologies of reading. It's a school like many others in New South Wales that have a diverse range of cultures, backgrounds and life experiences. That is my school, Marsden Road Public School. We are situated in Liverpool, South West Sydney. As a community, we represent 57 different cultural backgrounds. 89% of our community come from a language background other than English. One in five of our students have been through the refugee experience and 76% of the community identify as low socioeconomic status. For the, ch for the children at Marsden Road, more so than many other children, reading cannot be left to chance. <laughs> Up until recently, we have used reading programs that involve teaching phonics in context. And what were we seeing? Most of our students could read simple and predictable texts but most of them went and hit the year four reading slump. Most of our students could achieve proficiency in year three NAPLAN, but could not maintain that in year five. Our data showed we were leaving reading to chance. It challenged our teaching, our ideologies, and left us with numerous questions. To answer these questions, our principal uh, steered us towards the reading research, and we engaged with an expert literacy consultant that knew about the science of reading. We learnt, with, which has been summed up by Anne and Jennifer today, if our students gain in the alphabetic code early through systematic synthetic phonics, it increases reading volume, uh, sorry, sorry, they become fluent, accurate readers earlier, increasing reading volume and in turn improving vocabulary and comprehension. We learnt, use the science of reading and don't leave reading to chance. So how does my school abide by the statement, don't leave reading to chance? The teaching of reading begins on day one of kindergarten. Our students engage with phonological, explicit, sorry, explicit phonological awareness learning. Once they begin and have that strong foundation in phonological awareness, we begin to engage with the basic aspects of the alphabetic code. Every day for 30 minutes, they are explicitly taught systematic synthetic phonics. Once our students have this beginning understanding of taught phonics, we introduce decodable books. Once they demonstrate enough skills with those, those decodable books, they read more challenging books appropriate to their learning. This is all repeated from kindergarten through to year two. Each set of taught phonemes builds upon our students' current schema of the alphabetic code. In three years, our students learn to decode the English language. They learn the 44 phonemes and 200 most common graphemes. But I'm sure you're wondering, when does the real reading happen? When do our students gain meaning from reading? Because we teach the five essential components of reading, phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary and comprehension, it happens all the time. Woo! 
In the early years of school, instead of overloading our students with learning to read and reading to learn at the same time, we do the heavy lifting for our students and read to them. They learn how to improve their fluency. We explicitly teach vocabulary and develop strategies for comprehension. In the later years, most of our students have learnt the alphabetic code and we can spend more time on reading to learn. They build their academic vocabulary through reading, comprehend what they read and are less likely to encounter texts that are challenging. We don't leave reading to chance. The opposition calls on us to teach phonics in context. They have explained that phonics in context is enough, but I'm not talking about what is enough. I'm talking about what leaving things to chance. I'm not talking about leaving things to chance. I want something substantial, sorry. I'm trying to wrap up. I'm talking about children needing explicit instruction in the five essential components of reading in every classroom every day. We must use instructional methods that are systematic and sequential. This is especially important for teaching phonics, which unlocks the alphabetic code. We cannot let children drift along using invented strategies to read. Put simply, don't leave reading to chance. Thank you very much, Troy. And for the final speaker for the negative, we have Mark Diamond. Thank you for this opportunity, colleagues. Using meaning is not confusing, as Jennifer Buckingham said. It leads to ideas. Here's a radical notion. Many of us believe ideas are fundamental to learning. Meaning comes first. Phonics is not enough to meet the individual needs of each and every child. Troy has determined that we embrace his chosen approach based on facts. Well, I must say, Troy, who's facts? I accept your body of small data in your context, but surely we must draw upon a more comprehensive sampling than Marsden Road. Our government's National Reading Review in 05 stated that no one approach of itself can address complex nature of reading difficulty. An integrated approach requires that teachers have a thorough understanding of a range of effective strategies as well as, well as knowing when and how to apply them. Additionally, Adonu 2014 found English is the most regular of the irregular of the alphabetical languages with a phonological consistency of only 12%. By year five, children encounter more than 27 words with a phonological consistency, sorry, 27 new words each day that cannot be decoded using phonological strategies. A thorough platform for reading, I think not. Our opponents state that mastering the 44 sounds of English will allow young learners to free up working memory for higher order cognitive tasks. Their cookie cutter mentality fails to provide a foundation of fertile ground necessary for richer learning to germinate. At Lansvale, a high value add public school according to CC, we insist on teaching phonics in context as part of an authentic, balanced approach to literacy. It's on the public record that we grow students across strands of literacy between year three and five at nearly twice the national rate. Interestingly, two-thirds of our parents are in the lowest quartile of socioeconomic advantage. I've been an inf effective instructional leader for 15 plus years now, and lifting a commercial product off the shelf and implementing it en masse is not instructional leadership, no matter how it's done. <laughs> Reading and writing are reciprocal skills. Beautiful, rich classroom talk is the bridge between them. One V's experience with a powerful book, Ish. Miss V will have read this quality text provoking deep thought and analysis amongst her six-year-olds. Aaliyah says, I think the character in this book is acting the way he does because he's jealous of his brother. What do you think, Kingston? Well, Aaliyah, I'd like to take your idea and build upon it. Ramon is jealous, but this happens all the time in families. There's a fancy word for it. Chelsea pipes in with, yes, it's called um, sibling something. Manan says it. I respectfully disagree with you all, says Andrew. I think Leon is a bully and he's just sulking because he treats his family so badly. Miss V finally gets a word. So you guys think this book tells a story of relationships and feelings. 
Then she suddenly says, stop. Sorry, children, no more time for talk. It's 9.30. It's time for, you guessed it, synthetic phonics. <laughs> this interruption is incongruous, conflicted, and it's not going to happen at Lansdale Public School, let me tell you. Synthetic phonics as an approach artificially peels the application from the social experience that is real reading. To be a great teacher, one must first be a true learner. Teachers learn best when they are gifted with the time and space to reflect on practice. It's vital that we generate a culture of trust and purpose amongst teams of teachers. We will not dumb things down for teachers and arrogantly expect them to sing from the same hymn sheet. It's disrespectful to the profession, demoralising and dangerous. Teachers are highly talented and professional. They flourish, just like their students when they're invested in and participate in active learning using methods such as spirals of inquiry. Teachers respond as poorly as their students to games of guess what's inside my head. I've never yet met a teacher who if generously invested in did not embrace accountability on behalf of children. Show me the money. A disturbing view of this argument surfaces when we look at the positions of many of our, our opponents in this debate. Those who have a vested interest in commercial products for sale versus those who pursue complex understanding. Simply put, <laughs> deepening pockets versus deepening understanding. Active, committed teachers exploring a wide... This is a scholarly debate. A wide diet of peer-reviewed research versus sale pitches selling products not tested by anyone not selling them. Let's be blunt. We could, name this, we could rename this argument teachers versus retailers. The teaching of reading needs to be removed from the economic sphere or vice versa. Let me ask, would this debate even be necessary in Finland or in Singapore? As a profession, we refuse to allow members opposite to dictate and or drive the debate through a fear of or back to basics mantra. We will not dumb down a rigorous, rich and relevant approach to teaching and learning that has us on track in preparing kids for a big, brave world. We create lifelong learners at Lansdale. We are very close to state average performance according to NAPLAN. We get approximately 14 students into various selective schools annually and places like Westfield Sports, Newtown and Campbelltown Performing Arts and the Con. We create well-rounded champions of the future. We are most proud that a number of ex students approach us annually to do a practicum at Lansdale for their chosen course of study in teaching. I think you can see that our path of learning through curiosity and engagement has been a path well travelled. It has not merely been a journey of fundamentals and basic skills, an attempt to get reading right. Teaching and learning is something elegant, often messy, but it remains a beautiful endeavour. Please don't let members opposite make it robotic, mistrustful and mechanical. And in summing up, I'd just like to read you a decodable text. The tot and the pot. The tot is on the mat. The tot can see a pot. The tot is not on a mat. The tot can get the pot. I think this is the complication. <laughs> the pot is on the tot. Pam can see the tot and the pot. Pam can get a mop. The tot is on the mat with Pam. Hands up, who wants $7,000 for this? as opposed to $7,000 for this. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. We're going to have a Q&A session now. Um, I'd just like to remind you of some of the ground rules of the Q&A session. <laughs> I know a lot of you have a lot to say, but please make sure you are asking a question. Please keep your questions respectful, brief, and to the point. Um, you can direct your question to a particular speaker, and after that speaker has answered, the opposing side will have the opportunity to respond. 
If you don't nominate a speaker to respond, I'll offer each side the opportunity to respond to that question in turn. There's a few microphones around the room, so just be patient while the microphone comes to your direction. Um, could I open the floor for our first question, please? Um, up the back. Hi, and thank you. Can you hear me clearly down there? Yeah, we can. Thank you very much for this evening, and thank you to those people that have given up their time freely. Uh, to have such a huge audi audience means that this is incredibly important. I have a background in education and a university qualification times three that not once taught me the importance of the first stages of learning to read in kindergarten. We're not talking about birth. We're not talking about exposing children to um, understand how wonderful stories can be. And I asked the negative team, did you misinterpret the debate topic? And I asked that because... I say that respectfully and I ask that because all three speakers in the first two instances spoke about exposing babies to stories we all know is so incredibly important. We all know meaning is incredibly important. We are talking about teaching explicit synthetic phonics from kindergarten here in New South Wales. Just get you to come to your question. That please. is my question. Yep. Negative team, did you misinterpret the debate topic? Okay, is there a speaker you'd like to direct your question to? Robin, thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, no, we did not misinterpret the proposition. Our, <laughs> thank you. Our argument is that phonics is not enough, that it is vitally important that all of the other strategies are taught in concert if children are really going to learn to read. Explicit synthetic phonics instruction is not the answer. Everyone seems to be searching for a simple recipe that all children um, who are exposed to it will learn to read. Children learn to read in different ways. There isn't a one-size-fits-all. Phonic knowledge on its own, whether it's taught synthetically or in context, is not enough. On you heard that it, phonic knowledge is only going to help you with 12% of words. You heard that you can't decipher the word by itself without it being in a context. It doesn't make sense by itself. You need the meaning as well, the morphemic knowledge alongside it. Thank you. And for the affirmative team, would you like to respond? Yeah, very briefly, I'll just say, I'm not sure how many times we can repeat this, but we also are arguing that we, or we, we accept that phonics alone is not enough, uh, and we have not argued that children should teach or should, should learn phonics first, and you lock all the books in a cupboard until they've learned all their letter sounds. That's absolutely not what we are talking about. I'm not quite sure how we could have made that more uh, clear than we did. Uh, what we were talking about tonight, and tonight's um, debate topic was talking about t ways of teaching phonics that we know that phonological decoding is an essential aspect of learning to read, um, but the way that it's taught is under um, a lot of debate and is contested. So we were talking particularly about the way to teach phonics to make sure that all children um, are able to unlock the alphabetic code, which then allows them to make meaning from what they're reading. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. The quietest class I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation to the ladies and gentlemen. I enjoyed it 
We now know from fMRI scans and neuromagnetic imaging that words proceed from the visual cortex through the cingulate gyrus uh, to the left occipital temporal lobe. And when it's processed, it's processed in 150th of a millisecond after the first of the word appears on the retina. After 300 milliseconds, it is now left, goes to the left temporal and pole in the, and the broker's area for learning, for the matching up. Has your team done any research on what actually happens in a brain when children are learning to read? Who would like to respond to that? Um, <laughs> Kathy, would you like to no, respond to that? Absolutely none. I'm not a scientist, I'm a school teacher. What I've, yeah. what I've done is watch children struggle. And in response to your comment and the comment from the back, I've taught kindergarten. And I know from my experience and also from what I was taught when I became a teacher, what it is that happens. And it happened before I got to meet the child. It happened in the home. And I think that's acknowledged by the other team about the development of language and vocabulary that it precedes development of literacy. And what concerns me the most is that the children who are disadvantaged end up reading the pot and the tot and they never get Oliver Jeffers if that's what we are going to give them are decodable texts. So we need to help them learn how to read in context with those rich opportunities that we don't give them before they get to school. That's what concerns me. And no, I'm not a scientist, school teacher. Thank you. Um, yes, well, I'll, I'll take the point about the brain. There is some very um, valuable uh, neurological research going on and neuroscientific research. I tend to agree with the other side. I, I think that research is valuable, but we can have this discussion aside from that. What I would like to pick up on is the point about vocabulary. I think it's a very important one because obviously what we know and what both sides agree on is there's a huge amount of variability in the kind of oral language exposure that children get from different backgrounds. So we know that some children from disadvantaged backgrounds come to school with an enormous um, deficit in essentially their language and their, their vocabulary because they haven't had the opportunities that some more privileged children have. What I would argue is that teaching systematic phonics is the great equaliser because what you can do in a relatively short space of time is give kids the tools to be able to go out and read what they want for themselves and build their vocabulary. And that is a way that you can bridge that word gap in, 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 in a way that's much more successful than us trying to um, teach children vocabulary as, as teachers. So I think that's an important thing to bear in mind. Thank you, Anne. Come over our next question. Oh, this is, can't be believed. There, <laughs> there must be one up there. Thank you. It, it comes a little bit on the back of the gentleman's question over there and um, thank you very much both sides and this is addressed to everybody. Um, I, th I feel like I'm hearing about what's being done to children. I'm wondering if any of you have talked to children about um, how they might find the best way to, to learn reading and how that might influence your, your work, your research. Can we hear from um, Troy on this one? You're more than welcome to come and visit our school, time permitting. Um, our kids love learning their phonics early because they have short, small wins regularly so they can access text quickly. Um, the excitement in the classroom is just amazing. Um, I, I don't know how to describe it. We had um, some visitors last year that came to visit some of our students learning their synthetic phonics and they just blow them away. They know the fact that after a short vowel double consonant in a two-syllable two word that usually have LE at the end, like apple. This is in kindergarten. They're, just, they're amazed with language and they want to learn more. We talk about our morphology. We talk about morphology with the kids. We talk about etymology. They're just, they want more. Once they start, it just keeps going. I, I can't sell it more than what the kids show. Thanks, Troy. Thank you. 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 Th
Troy. Mark. Look, um, I walked out of school today as um, kindergarten on the veranda. Um, we dressed up in pilot hats and Ray-Bans. They had barcodes and scanners. They had little boys on telephones and they were simulating um, a, an aircraft um, flight. And I went up to phone and said, what do you, what do you, you've got $100 in your hand phone. What is that for? And he said, oh, I'm flying to Cronulla and when I get there, I want to buy gelato. <laughs> and the richness of the playful experience that's at the basis of literacy and numeracy acquisition was, it, was enacted in there and then. And so, you know, a rich, ex explicit and systematic um, is absolutely mandatory, but significant and relevant is even more important. And little kids being playful, allow, I've, I've read the research, and I haven't got the same brain theory research that you do, Lyle, but I've heard Nathan Wallace talk about the biggest predictor in success in life is the amount of words said from mother to child in the first 1,000 days of their existence as they're laying down a platform for meaningful, um, experience-based learning. So I'd, I'd like to throw a challenge at Jennifer, actually. I, if I'm welcome to come to Marsden Road where I have honourable, good friends working hard, making a difference, doing their personal best, taking an approach, I'd love to come and see synthetic phonics in action, on balance, and, and make my mind up myself. And I challenge Jennifer to come to Lansdale and see a more balanced, rich approach in action and, and judge for yourself, Jennifer, the, the potential merits of teaching phonics in Cranford. Thanks, Mark. That sounds like a very productive exercise. Um, thank you so much to everyone um, tonight for your, um, for your attention and um, for coming along and participating in such an important discussion. Um, I'd like now to introduce uh, Tom Switzer. Um, he is uh, going to um, close the evening for us tonight. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Natasha, and uh, thank you to the Australian College of Educators. And thanks to all of you for being a great audience this evening. Thank you very much. I, uh, as Natasha mentioned, I'm the Executive Director at the Centre for Independent Studies, and uh, CIS is a public policy research organisation. Uh, we've existed for more than four decades, and we're primarily committed to promoting the principles of classical liberalism. So individual choice, a limited democratic government, a productivity enhancing reform, reading, literacy, numeracy, all that, uh, as well as, and this is important, we stand for open and civilised debate that speaks beyond that rampant polarisation and that toxic polarisation that all too often characterises the public discourse, not just in Canberra, uh, but in many parts of the Western world. I think we've had a great debate here this evening on phonics. Um, two of my favourite quotes about the rules of debate, I think they've been met here this evening. Uh, the first rule is by the great 19th century British liberal John Stuart Mill, who said, uh, he who knows only his own position knows little of that because only when you know the strengths of your opponent's arguments can you possibly rebut it. And the second great quote, I think, for debate is the great American 20th century liberal, uh, Sidney Hook, who said, uh, before you impugn someone's motives, even if they may be legitimately impugned, uh, first answer their argument. And I think they're very important rules for debate and discussion, especially in these polarising times. I want to thank both schools of thought, the affirmative side, Anne, Jen and Troy. The affirmative side. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank the negative side, led by Robin, Kathy, and Mark. I want to thank the, the New South Wales Minister for Education, Rob Stokes, for those great opening remarks that really set the scene here uh, for this evening. Thank you, Minister. 
Thank you to our co-sponsors, the Australian College of Educators, and thank you also to the host and the moderator of tonight's proceedings, the distinguished journalist from the ABC, Natasha Robinson. And finally, let me thank all of you. I mean, I know there were a few interventions here and there, but look, I think all things considered, you behaved extremely well, <laughs> very politely and extremely fairly. So thank you all, and let's do it again. Thank you so much, and enjoy this evening. Great. Close it off. That's great, Anne.